Hi guys, my name is PD, and today I want to address a very important concern that I know has arised amongst many in fellowships and churches all around the world with regards to uh, evil, unclean spirits masquerading as angels of light. And especially more in particular in this video, we are going to talk about the gift of tongues. Because what I have found is that there's this concern with regards to if we allow others to speak in tongues in our fellowships, how do we know that they are not speaking from an unclean spirit? How do we know that they're not um, having a counterfeit gift that is actually a demon speaking through them in tongues? Look, it is no secret that in witchcraft and paganism and many other religions around the world, there is speaking in tongues, uh, what we call speaking in tongues in a similar way exercised. And this is not even supposed to be weird because we I come from South Africa, right? And there when I was there, I dealt with many people who were involved in witchcraft because witchcraft is a big deal in Africa in general. And there were many people who went to witch doctors to get healing. All right. And we have a spiritual gift that is a holy, amazing, beautiful spiritual gift of God. Like we see how our Messiah, how Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew is his name. He walked in this gift of healing, right? He walked in supernatural things and we have all these counterfeits. We have these other counterfeit religions who try to do the same thing. And it's not a new thing. I mean, when we look at Egypt, right? And we have Pharaoh and his his sorcerers with Moses. We have Moses coming and Moses has the staff, right? And and this staff turns into a snake. And the same thing happens with the sorcerers. They do the same thing. And then we have God's snake eating up the snake of snakes of Pharaoh. So this counterfeiting, this copycat thing, that Satan is trying to copy God's things have been happening from the beginning. So just because there is a copycat, just because there is a counterfeit, just because there is something that is that the enemy is doing that is similar to what God has done in the beginning, it doesn't mean that God's thing is wrong, bad, evil, and it should not turn us away from what God has originally planned for us to walk in. Because I want to submit to you that that is what the enemy number one wants to do. Number one, above all else, is he wants to scare you away from what God actually wants you to walk in. He wants to hurt you, cause confusion, etc. And he has been successful in many ways. And so this question is a question of that, because we are asking this question out of fear for what if we speak in tongues and it is a how do we know it's Holy Spirit? How do we know it's not a demon? How do we know when someone else speaks or prays in tongues, it's, the, it's Holy Spirit and not a demon? Right. And then what happens is we get afraid of this idea and we actually totally start quenching the Holy Spirit in our fellowships. Oh, and it's not because we want to be. It's just because we want to be careful. And I understand that. But we need to talk about this so we can make a uh, an informed decision on how we handle these things. So we have balance because we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. And we also don't want to allow unclean spirits in, of course. Right. And so how do we deal with this thing? So first off, we need to just talk about kind of a side subject here, and that is the flesh. Just because something is done not perfectly according to God's will doesn't always mean that it is a demon doing it. It can be our flesh too. I remember once uh, uh, last year I was at a conference and I was speaking on the gift of tongues briefly. And there was someone who raised their hands in the Q&A questions and answer section. And they asked, you know, about this gift. And they said that they believe there were people who had demons using this gift and it was demon speaking. And the reason they said that this was the case was because these people were speaking without an interpreter interpreting what was being said. Okay, so 
Here we have an issue just similar to what Paul actually addresses in his book of 1 Corinthians 14. He talks about how there are people speaking in church without an interpreter all at once. It's it's kind of chaotic, it seems. And and Paul was saying, you guys need an interpreter. If there's no interpreter in a public setting, a big setting, big, a lot of people there, all this stuff, and there's no interpreter, then let him rather keep quiet and speak to God him alone. OK, so. Paul did not, however, say that this person who does this has a demon. This person needs to get a demon cause out of them because they are speaking in tongues without an interpreter. No, that's not the reason. The reason was actually a fleshly issue because in the church of Corinth, these people were all speaking in tongues at once. In other words, they're, they were making a decision to exercise a spiritual gift in a way that was not necessarily desired by God. And you may think, wow, how is that even possible? Well, it is because God is working with his spiritual gifts with us in communion with us. Think about it this way. If you give a gift to your son or daughter, a new bike, for example, and you tell him, I want you to drive this bike under a certain speed limit. All right. I don't want you to drive it too fast. But if they go and they drive that bike, 200 miles an hour. All right. Um, and they get in a car accident or something and they get hurt. It was the child's responsibility to use it wisely. And so similarly, it is our responsibility to use the gifts that God has you get given us responsibly because we can use them irresponsibly because God trusts us with them. And so you can go and speak in tongues without there being an interpreter in a big church setting and you can sh shout it out and and cause confusion, etc. Do it improperly in, in contradiction to how Paul described us to do it. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a demon doing it. It just means that your flesh, you through your flesh decided to do something you're not necessarily supposed to do. So I want to submit to you that not always is it the demon when a gift is exercised improperly. Oftentimes it's simply our flesh and we just need some instruction on how to do it if like correctly. Right. OK, so keeping that in mind, let's now move on to what if it is a demon, because the way we know, you know, is that if it is the flesh in a person, they can change their behavior. They just need instruction and then they change their behavior. Just like Paul, he just gave them instruction, the church of Corinth, and then they probably changed their behavior. They stopped doing what they were doing wrong. But if after giving instruction, if even understanding what you're doing wrong or, you know, the person doesn't change, they cannot in fact change. They actually don't even have a lot of control over what they're doing. Then we're leaning more towards this is probably a demonic manifestation because the Holy Spirit has the, the fruit of self-control. And if self-control is not there, then we need to start asking if this is a demon or not. When I say self-control, you need to understand that I can still choose. I have control over what I do and I can choose with my control to exercise it improperly. OK, that's my flesh choosing something. But if I don't have self-control, that means I cannot control myself. That means that I just do things outside of my control. Then that is that is more leaning towards a demonic manifestation. OK, so now we're going to move into a church setting. Let's just say there's someone coming into church and you're the pastor of the church or you're an elder and there's people praying and they're speaking. There's a man who speaks in tongues, right? And he speaks in tongues and, and he's quite loudly speaking in tongues. And you're concerned. I don't know this man. I don't know where he's from. He's new in this fellowship. Is he speaking from the Holy Spirit or is he speaking something else? Well, here's the thing. Paul describes speaking in tongues in a public assembly, right? Like we just discussed earlier, there has to be an interpreter. So you allow him to speak for like a few, like 20, 30 seconds, whatever it is. And then, OK, is there an interpreter? You call out, is there anyone who can understand what was being said? If there's no interpreter, then that man, scripture says, needs to 
he, he's not necessarily now speaking from a demon. He's not speaking even necessarily from his flesh. It's just that that what he was speaking was probably just for himself. And that doesn't mean he was doing something wrong. We have to be gracious and merciful on that, right? We just let them know, okay, speak to yourself and to God. That's your word, right? And then they don't have to speak on anymore because they have no precedent for doing so. You see, if whether someone is speaking from the Holy Spirit or from a demon, it doesn't matter. This same protocol has to be followed. So that means that no one is going to be praying from a demon in tongues for a long period of time, if they are even speaking from a demon. And so because Paul says that there has to be an interpreter for there to be public edification for someone to say this was what was being said, right? I want to submit to you. Similarly, there has to be an interpreter for there to be public destruction. For the be for there for this for a demon to cause any kind of destruction. And what I mean by that is this. If, if someone speaks from a demon in tongues and is a counterfeit, right? This person was in witchcraft, they or and they're they're coming in to cause destruction. Someone for that to even cause any destruction, like you need someone to interpret bad things that are being said in tongues because no one understands what is being said unless there's an interpreter. And that means no damage can be done. And even if it was a good thing being said, no edification can be given. So we really don't need to worry about this because there has to be an interpreter either way if this is a bigger fellowship and you don't know the people there. You see, I have heard teachers say that, you know, we have to be very careful about when we exercise this gift of speaking in tongues because you don't even know what you say yourself. And, you know, you can speak from a demon and not even know it. You can speak cursings and not even know it. You can curse God and not even know it. Listen, like the, the scriptures just don't make provision for that. It doesn't say that a believer who really in their heart is trying to worship God is going to accidentally curse God. Like it doesn't work that way. And if that was the case, Paul would have warned us against that. Think about it this way. Let's just step away from the gift of tongues for a second. When you pray in English, what is it that causes you to pray blessing and good things and things of the Holy Spirit? Is it not the Holy Spirit? Is it not your heart of worship unto God that does it right? That's that's it. Like it, it is from the heart that the mouth overflows. So if your heart is filled with praise to God for with worshiping him with all these things, then that is what's going to come out. Even if you speak in other English or in, in an unknown language to you in tongues. So we don't have to worry about, am I going to curse God? No, you're not going to curse God. If you're, if you have a heart of praising and worshiping him, the people who are going to be cursing God are the people who have a heart of cursing God. Those are witches, those in paganism, those in, uh, those who hate him, right? Those who are in deep sin and who hate God, they are the ones speaking cursings against God. They're the ones who maliciously go ahead and maliciously exercise some counterfeit gift if at all, if they have something like that to do, they it's like witch doctors right in Africa. I just spoke about that earlier. These witch doctors, you go to them to get healing. You don't get healing when you go to them, though. You get curses on your life. You get horrible things that happen to you because demons are imparted. But see, you get that because that is what this man is praying from. That is the heart they are praying from. I know that a lot of us are very much afraid of these things that I'm talking about here, are very afraid of witches, demons, unclean spirits, you know, the Kundalini spirit, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, but the question is, is are we supposed to be afraid? Are we supposed to be scared? You know, I'm not talking again, speaking about these things in terms, because we have to. The, the scriptures tell us to test the spirits. But are we supposed to be afraid of them? What, what is our perspective supposed to be on these things? You know, when we look at 1 John 4 verse 1, we read, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God tells us, yes, these these false prophets. Yes, these these people, unclean spirits, things of Satan, Hasatan. But don't fret. You have overcome them. You are not of this world. You have overcome them through Christ. Because of his blood, he gives us authority to trample on the snake just like he did. And so when we read on further, we can look at an example of this. When we read about the story in Acts 19, we read about how there were these Jewish exorcists trying to cast out demons by the name of Jesus, even though they didn't really believe or follow Jesus. We read this Acts 19 verse 13 Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Shiva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So we see that these demons actually had reverence. They had fear for Jesus and Paul and they respected Jesus and Paul's authority. But they did not respect these men's authority because they had no true relationship with Jesus. They did not know God truly because Jesus is the one from which where we get our authority over unclean spirits. Remember that he told his disciples, I give you authority over unclean spirits so that they will be in submission to you. Therefore, do you really think that the apostles disciples were afraid of unclean spirits after seeing this authority they have? No way. Do you think they were afraid of the sorcerers? No way. In fact, we actually see them. They didn't care at all. And they just casted the demons out left and right. And they just they were like, whatever. They were never afraid of this. And so when we read in Matthew 8, 29, another example, they began screaming at him. Why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? This example is how the demons were so afraid of our Messiah questioning whether he's going to torture them. And so you see, in light of all this, I'm not afraid of demons. I am not afraid if there's someone manifesting a demon. I'm not afraid if there's a witch doctor who's trying to cause some spell on me. I'm not even afraid for if someone is going to come in and, you know, try and pray against me and their with, with their God or with their demon. It doesn't matter because I have greater authority. Greater is the one who's in me that's in, who's, than the one who's in them. I And God says, I have overcome them. I don't have to worry about them. The people, however, who are impacted by unclean spirits are people who do not have authority. And I'm not saying that people who have the Holy Spirit can never be have oppression by demons and that demons cannot come and, and, and try and especially through our flesh um, and through our sin and through open doors come in. Of course, that can happen. But but when it comes to these attacks and these things that we are so afraid of, when we are in um, in God, we don't have to worry as much about it. And we need to just understand that the way that evil spirits and Kundalini spirits and things actually come into churches is because they were allowed in. These manifestations of demons that we sometimes see happen in churches are sometimes confused to be the Holy Spirit. People think it's the Holy Spirit. And instead of casting out the demon, they just say, oh, thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you for this demonic manifestation, even though they don't understand that it's not Holy Spirit. It's a demon. And those are the cases, though. That is when demons start coming into churches. 
It, they don't come into churches when they're not allowed to come in. We must allow them by our authority in for them to come in. So they will try and appear like an angel of light. They will come in and masquerade as an angel of light so that they can gain our approval so that we allow them in instead of casting out demons out of anyone who has them. I hope that this makes sense. Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid of this gift of speaking in tongues. Do not listen to those who tell you that, you know, do not speak in tongues because you're going to speak in a, from a demon. Like, do not worry about that. If you know who you are, you are for you are a child of God. You know what you're doing. You know what your heart is. It's OK. Don't worry about that. It is when we when we when we lose self-control, it is when we lose the fruits of the spirit it is when we lose the things that are that identify the Holy Spirit. And that is the fruits of the spirit. That is when we need to start questioning when it is not self-control, meekness, kindness, gentleness, all these things happening when there isn't um, freedom. But don't let this throw you all the way, let you throw the ba baby out of the bath water and say, oh, no, speaking tongues allowed, no spiritual gifts allowed. No, 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 no. Because if someone if, imagine this, imagine that you ban praying in your church because there are people who can be um, witches who come in and they they have prayers too. Are you going to then say no one is allowed to pray for anyone because of that? No, we're not going to do that. Right? We're not going to ban prayer because witches pray too. That's the same thing. We're not going to similarly ban speaking in tongues or praying in tongues because other people try to do them too, maybe who have even bad intentions. All right, guys, I hope that this teaching has blessed you and given you clarity and peace. Run after the spiritual gifts. Don't let the enemy steal them from you and you will see the Holy Spirit come in power in your fellowships. And then that is going to be the thing that drives out the demons. You don't want to just get rid of the spiritual gifts because then you're going to never get rid of the, any demons if there are any in your fellowships. All right. Blessings and Shalom.